all. Great. Well, thank you very much. It's really an honor to be here this afternoon um, to talk about my favorite topic, which is World War I, and I guess for some in the room, also your favorite topic, because there's been a lot of Johnny come lately is just getting interested in the war once America gets involved, but it sounds like you guys have been going strong since 2014, so that's fantastic, mm -hmm. right, to really already have a strong base of interest in the war. My topic today is the African American soldier experience, and I want to thank Michael for really raising, I think, a lot of themes that I'm going to build upon in terms of the specificity of how that connects to the First World War, and it's great to have a broader perspective of where what I'm going to talk about fits into understanding the African American soldier experience in the 19th and 20th centuries. And I think that one of the things that you'll see in some of the remarks that I'm going to make is that in the African American community they're very aware of this history and they're very aware of the past and they're very aware of what they hope for the, will be in the present. And so this sense of understanding uh, their place in the entirety of, of, of American history is very much at the forefront of people's minds at the time. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to begin by kind of taking us back to the First World War environment in the United States and to, and to in some sense, begin to appreciate how the minute America decides to enter the war, almost overnight things change in America. And we have gone from a period of two and a half years where there's been a lot of debate over whether or not this is America's war to fight. And there certainly has been propaganda coming into the country and arguments on both sides. But once the United States decides to enter the war, um, we come in, as we know, quite late, April of 1917. We, we come in and the government almost immediately begins to uh, become a presence in people's private lives in a way that it has never been before. One of those things is going to be through actually raising an army. We're going to be conscripting it, it, the majority of forces into the majority of our forces. We're going to be mobilizing our economy. And I wanted to show these slides here to even just have us understand how the visual landscape of America changes. It becomes almost impossible for people to forget the war. Walking down the street, going into a restaurant, getting your hair cut, opening the newspaper, uh, going to school, going to work, any of these activities is really going to just bombard you with official propaganda. And here's a, a, a good representation of literally how city spaces become just plastered with this official propaganda. And when we think about the First World War, um, this, these tend to be the kinds of images that we narrow in on. We look a lot at the sort of official message that the government is trying to send to its citizens about their responsibility to participate in this war effort. And because America was a multi-ethnic and multi-racial society, messages had to be sent to many different communities. So you will see, for example, official propaganda in many foreign languages. Uh, you look at African American newspapers, magazines, you'll see war bond posters uh, being replicated as ads in those newspapers. In other words, every, every space, every community is being targeted. But there's something that we often leave out of the story, and this is the part of the changing visual landscape that I want to emphasize more today than the government's messaging, which I think we're often quite familiar with. And that is that one of the other things that happens during the war is that there's an amazing rise in privately produced propaganda. Displaying patriotic posters, hanging flags in your windows, showing that you are supportive of the war effort, this is something that generates a lot of private enterprise as well. And the government does not actually create a lot of propaganda specifically for the African American community. But within the African American community, we see a lot of privately produced propaganda. And this is important, I feel, as an historical resource for us because it can help us start understanding what the experience means for people within that community, not just looking from without in terms of the government is telling you what this means, but what do African Americans themselves consume and produce in terms of propaganda to give this war effort meaning. 
And so this is one of the posters that I wanted to start with, and I don't think that you can actually see at the bottom it says true blue, that's the captioning of the poster. But this in some ways is a very typical piece of, of wartime propaganda. We have a family that's very, very well off, they're, they have a nice house, they have, they're, they're well clothed, they have the father of the family who's serving in the armed services. You can see his portrait over the mantle and the flags are draped around him. Uh, we've got George Washington, uh, Woodrow Wilson, and then Abraham Lincoln. In, in privately produced propaganda in the African American community, Abraham Lincoln will always be the biggest figure. He, he's, he's evident in almost every single one of these, of these posters. Um, and we can see that in many respects this is a family that is supporting the war effort. They're doing, they're doing their job. There's two interesting clues in this poster about the fate of this man. I'm not sure if anybody can, um, can see, see these. Uh, I'm going to give you a little quiz here. So is, he, is, this, is this father alive or, is, or has he been killed in combat? Well, the star is the right clue, but it's it would, that, star. it would be a gold star. It's a gold star, right? So, the, so the flag was the clue. So the blue star means that he's still alive, and if he had been killed, the star would turn to gold. So today, if you've heard of the organization Gold Star Mothers, mm -hmm. this is where this comes from, and this had been a very intentional campaign on the part of the government to ask people to hang these types of flags in their windows. And this gives you a little bit of a, a different clue about the kinds of casualties America was expecting to take on. They were really worried, because we thought that we were going to be in the war probably for at least three years. Nobody knew it was going to end so quickly. They were very worried that once the casualty started you know, mounting, and, and you would walk down the street, what you were going to see if people followed traditional practices was all these houses sort of draped in black, houses in mourning. And they didn't want that because that was going to depress civilian morale. So they thought, well, if you have a flag and you just change the star, you're honoring the dead without sort of as assuming this mantle of mourning that was going to really depress spirits. So that's one important clue. But the other important clue in terms of what's happening to him is that German helmet that's above the flags. And that German helmet above the flags is a souvenir from the battlefront that he sent home to his family. And so that's an important signifier for us, but it signifies that he's at the front lines, that he actually is a combatant. And as we all know, if you want to use military service to improve your status in civilian society, to come home and argue that we've fought for our country, we've, we've been willing to die for our country, if you're not on the front lines, you can't actually make that argument. And so the idea that you would have not just African Americans serving in the military, but that you would have men serving in the front lines and actually fighting, this was an important part of the equation, or it may not actually work out the way that you hoped. Okay? Now, here's a different uh, one that we have. I'm not going to spend quite as long on this one, but you can see that it sort of replicates a lot of the same ideas you have in this case the family uh, actually at the boat where the the father is is going off to war and as you can go around these scenes you can see that he is fighting he's 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 being honored for his fighting he's coming home to acclaim uh, and this family is waiting for him happy to welcome him that in a sense this is the representation of the African American soldier our colored fighters that's what it's called and this is the idea that we, are, we have willingly served our country, we're fighting hard, we're welcomed home, and this is uh, a representation of that honorable service. Now when you're an historian and you see things like this, you do always want to start asking some questions, especially when you see a piece of visual evidence. And I'm kind of purporting to you that these represent opinions or views within the African American community. But just because somebody makes a poster, that doesn't necessarily mean that anybody bought it or that they put it up on their walls or that it was widely distributed or seen, right? How do you, how can you actually make these kinds of conclusions from just seeing a particular image, right? So you want to dig maybe a little bit deeper and try to see could you have some evidence that these things actually were circulated. And so at least some of the ones that I'm showing you, I do have some, some sense that 
my conclusions have merit. Um, I can look, for example, to ads in The Crisis, which is the NAACP's newspaper, and here I can see ads that are actually advertising these posters that I've been showing you for sale, encouraging people to actually put them on their, on their, on their, their walls. Um, I can see uh, a poster like this, which is interesting. It's, again, I'm not sure if you can see the caption here. It says, the colored man is no slacker. Again, a very, uh, um, uh, what I would say, idolized version of a sweetheart sending, sending maybe her boyfriend or maybe her husband off to war. Um, I can have some, some certainty here. I actually have a private uh, copy of this poster. I found it in an antique shop, framed. Somebody bought this and hung it on their wall, right? So that's what the crisis is telling you. Hang these on your wall. You know, this is representation of who we are. And, and just also the, the amount of these that you find. So the more that you find, if you only find one copy of something, maybe that's all there is. But you find more and more of these, you have more faith that they're actually being circulated. So just a little, a little bit there about evidence in terms of really understanding what it is that we're, that we're seeing here. Now, I wanted to pick up on this line here, the colored man is no slacker, because slacker was an important term in the World War I era, and it was a derogatory term. If you were calling somebody a slacker, the implication was that you were trying to evade your duty. You were trying to evade your responsibility to actually serve in the war. Right? Now, we have a little bit of a conundrum when it comes to the African American soldier because there were very few opportunities for African-American men to volunteer for service. There were only a small number of regiments where they could volunteer, and those filled up almost immediately. And so the vast majority of African-American men, like the vast majority of all men in America, were going to have to wait until they were drafted into service in order to serve in the American military. And so, Slacker could come and mean many, many things. It could mean unwillingness to serve. It could also mean unwillingness to comply with selective service because we have almost from the very beginning of the war uh, the enactment of the Selective Service Act, that's the new name for the draft, that is going to require all men of draft eligible age to actually register for the draft. And it's interesting how this transforms the process of entering the military. In the Civil War, for example, we already had that example given to us, the draft was not instituted until midway through the war, and it was really meant to induce men to, to enlist. But in the First World War, it's quite different. I've already pointed out that there's limited opportunities to enlist, and they want to make conscription really the normal way that you come into the military. And so what's going to happen is that on June 15, 1915, there's a National Registration Day. And on that day, all men between the ages of 21 and 30 have to go to their polling places and they have to fill out this draft registration card. Right? And if you know your American history, <laughs> I decided to pick somebody famous for us. <laughs> so this is Marcus Garvey's registration card. And so here he's registering in New York. And there's a lot of interesting things about his registration card. First of all, you can see that he's 30 years old, so he's near the very end of draft eligible age to begin with. You can see he's not an American citizen, right? He's, he's, he's a British citizen, he's from Jamaica, and he, he puts that here. That does not automatically exempt him from the draft. Just because you're not an American citizen doesn't mean you're exempt from the draft. There are one out of every five soldiers in the First World War was foreign born. So you could still be drafted into the military even if you were, even if you were not an American citizen. You were supposed to have declared your, your desire to become a citizen, but that did not always, always work out. Um, and here you can see that he says, uh, are you going to claim um, an exemption? And he says, yes, I am. <laughs> I'm going to claim an exemption. I'm claiming that I'm physically unfit. And if, obviously, he's never drafted into the, into, the, into the military here. And I found this interesting when I was, when I was looking this over the other day, because um, I'd kind of forgotten this, that he's only 5'4". And he's always seemed so much you know, taller in stature, but, but actually not that, not that tall at all. Right? 
So, so we want to look at, so here's Marcus Garvey's again, and then I pulled up another, another one here. This is from Alvin York, another very famous soldier from the First World War. We made a movie about him, Gary Cooper played him in a 1940 movie called Sergeant York. Um, anybody see a difference between these two cards? Yeah, you see it, right? You see it here, right? So right here, per, if person is of African descent, tear off this corner, right? So if you, so Marcus Garvey, either he or the person who's taking his card tears that corner off, for Alvin York does not. And this is, I think, another important indication to us that your age, your ethnicity, your physical fitness, your height, those were all important things in terms of determining where you're going into the military and where you were going. But another important factor was your race. Right? If you are white and if you are African American, the military wants like an easy way to sort that out because that will determine a lot about what's going to happen to you and the ways that the military has decided to use you. Right? So you can see the importance that the military is putting on singling out race in terms of the conscription process to understand just how important that was going to end up being. Now, uh, just last one, I'm not gonna pull you all famous <laughs> draft cards of every famous person I can come up with, but this is Louis Armstrong. This is from 1918, so the card does get adapted over time. Now it's no longer ripping off a corner, but now you can see that race is, is straight in the middle, right? It's still something important that you're going to have to note. You know, are you, and, and here it's sort of, uh, you know, white, Negro, Oriental, in, are you an Indian, and are you a citizen or not, and then again, your ethnicity, in terms of understanding what the military is going to do with you. So if I, if I say to you race really matters and the military needs to know this about you right from the very beginning, the question could be, well, why? Why is this such an important thing? And I wanted to just lay out a few of the questions that this introduces to the military. For the first time, they're creating an army of four million people. They know it's going to be multi-ethnic. They know it's going to be multiracial. But when you want to create a segregated army, there's actually a lot of questions that you have to answer about doing that. So one question that has to be ra uh, answered right away is when you create these segregated African-American units, where are they going to train? Where are they going? Are they all going to certain camps? Are we spreading African-American units out throughout the country to keep some sort of balance between white and black in check? Right? Where are they going to go? Uh, what are they going to do when they get there? Are they going to learn how to fire guns? Are they going to learn to maneuver? Are they going to be combatants? What are they going to actually learn to do? Um, who's going to lead them? Are they going to have black officers? These are, these are the questions that the military has to answer in 1917. And it's interesting to read the arguments that are going on in War Department circles over this. Because on the one hand, you have a group of officials who go back to the Civil War. They go back to Spanish-American War. They, they say they go back to the Mexican border and say it's clear that African-American soldiers are excellent combatant troops, that they can fight in combat. We have no question about that. Now, black officers, we're not so sure about that one. We're definitely sure that when properly led, they can fight well in combat. But the military is not in sole charge of this question. Civilian communities are also involved, and they weigh in. And you have many southern communities that are very concerned about the future. So we think African-American soldiers, they're coming in, they're looking to the future. White southerners are looking to the future too. And they're saying, well, wait a minute. When these guys come home, we're going to have trouble if they've been trained to be fighters and they've been trained to know how to, to, know how to lead. So we want to minimize that disruption to the racial status quo. And so the, the upshot of all of this is that there will be compromises made. Because while we have southern communities weighing in, we also have a very vocal civil rights movement, like the you know, organizations like the NAACP also weighing in and saying, if you claim this is the war for democracy 
and you say that black soldiers can't fight and have to be officered by whites, how can you actually make this claim? And so the compromise will be that black units will be spread throughout the country, not concentrated. This is so that there can't be some sort of rebellion. And there will be um, very few opportunities, but there will be some opportunities for African American officers in the infantry and the field artillery. So limited opportunities to lead, spreading African American units throughout the country, and the vast majority of African American soldiers will be designated as non-combatants. So it's not nothing, but it's not everything either. And so we'll see that of the 400,000 African Americans that serve, 89% of them were not going to serve, excuse me, I'm gonna go all the way back to this, in roles like this. 89% of them will serve as non-combatants. So this, this scenario will only apply to 40,000 men. Right? These, are, these are the numbers of men in the 92nd and the 93rd who will actually be able to be combatants. There are, there are some women who are able to get to France in the YMCA, but no African-American nurses, no African-Americans can come in and work as telephone operators or clerks, the kind of jobs that were open, open to women. So that's a great question. Yeah, there. Now this, this means that for these 40,000 men on whom so many expectations and so many hopes are being pinned, that's a huge responsibility, right? Because there's a lot that's riding on their, on their wartime service. Okay, so if we, if we kind of go through the recruit's experience, we can see that there's, there's a lot of ways in which the African-American experience is unique, yet at the same time typical. So I have these photos. We've got African-American recruits training. You know, this is a very typical kind of scene of the way that conscripts arrived at training camps wearing their civilian clothes, not marching in formation, maybe carrying a suitcase or two. And then, of course, once they've got uniforms on, training and learning how to actually become soldiers. Where were the training camps? The training, the training camps that African Americans were in were throughout the entire country. Okay. So, so basically, they were not wanting to concentrate African American soldiers in a few camps or even in the South, because they always wanted there to be a majority of white soldiers in any one camp. So about how many different camps were there? There's about 60, so something like that. Yes, I mean, there's, there's, it's hard to give a number because there's large ones, small ones, but I'm gonna, I'll say there's about 60 different training camps throughout the country. And there's one training camp for African American officers, and that's in Des Moines, Iowa. Thank you. Okay, so that's the only camp that's ever run for African American officers. Now, for these soldiers, so this part is, you know, this is in a sense what every recruit is going to go through. They're going to get on a ship, uh, go to France. 200,000 African American soldiers will actually make it to France. And this is again a very normal part of, of the American experience of war. This idea of leaving your home maybe for the first time, spending some time in New York City, uh, getting on a boat and traveling overseas, which is gonna take 10, to two, 10 days to two weeks. Uh, often it's a dangerous journey. There are U-boats that are patrolling the seas. Many men have not been on a ship before. They get seasick for the first time. I mean, many people have never seen the ocean. It sort of depends where you're coming from. I mean, all of these experiences are brand new. And so at the time that you are in a segregated unit, you're still experiencing the world kind of opening up to you because you're suddenly seeing things you may never have thought you ever would have seen. Would you have expected to go to New York City? I mean, there aren't too many American men from rural areas in the country that thought this was in the cards for them, right? Would you have thought that you got on a boat, that you went overseas, that you had this, you had this experience? These are not necessarily normal experiences that people had in 1917. So after these troops get to France, for many of these African American soldiers that I've been talking about, this is the kind of scene that they're going to, uh, that they're going to see uh, in Brest, France. So, so this is a, 
a great example of what it means to fight in the First World War. Some of these things I've been hinting at. You have to mobilize your economy at home. You have to mobilize public opinion to support the war. You have to conscript a very large army, right? This is part of fighting on the Western Front. It's a mass industrial war. It takes a lot of resources. But what an army in the front needs is a huge supply train behind it to keep it going and to keep it fed, to keep, to keep munitions going, to keep momentum forward. And so a lot of African American soldiers that travel to France, this will be as far as they get. They will stay in Brest. They will be the people who are unloading these boxes from the ships and sending them on their way into the interior lines. And we have a pretty interesting photograph of, of, of what this war experience could mean, the sort of day-to-dayness of it. There's again a lot of interesting things going on in this photograph. You can see that in fighting an industrial war, even though you're a non-combatant, you're providing manual labor, you're almost replicating the factory experience on a dock. So you've got these guys there taking these, these excuse me, these uh, boxes off of the ship, but look at this conveyor belt that they have. I mean, you could almost be like in a Ford factory at the time in terms of thinking about the way you're going to break down these tasks to make them done as efficiently as possible. So these men are almost working in this kind of factory-like environment. But again, I'm not sure if you can see it well from the lighting here, <clears throat> but they have uniforms on. It's quite cold. But over their uniforms, they have work overalls. Yeah. Right? And what does it mean to tell a soldier to put on work overalls? Heavy labor. Heavy labor, right? Basically, you're not really a soldier. You're a worker, right? You're working in uniform, but don't think that in fact you are a soldier, you are a fighting man. And you can see the supervision behind, behind this black unit, white, white non-combatants, right? Being supervised by basically a white foreman. In some respects, these could be black workers in a factory with a white foreman sort of supervising what they're doing. That in many respects, there's very little <clears throat> in their day-to-day -day lives that is meant to reinforce the notion that they're soldiers in the American military. And I would have to tell you that none of this is accidental. This is very intentional on the part of military authorities. So those earlier questions that I was saying with, what are they going to learn? What are they going to do? What are they going to be like when they come home? There is a lot of discussion about that. And one of the conclusions is that the less that you emphasize the fact that they are indeed soldiers, the fewer problems you're going to have. So if they wear the same clothes and they do the same work, as they would do at home, then they're just going to reintegrate seamlessly and it's going to be like it never happened. Right? So, so you have a lot of civil rights organizations and many African American soldiers themselves coming in believing that this is going to be a transforming experience, but then you have very conscious institutional policies being put into place to not have that happen. Right? That, 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 that's an understanding everybody has and this stuff is not an accident. Right? And so this will give you an idea of, of what happens to some of uh, the units that we're talking about. One of the most famous units of the war for African Americans is the 369th, the Harlem Hellfighters. You've probably heard of them, right? So the Harlem Hellfighters have been a National Guard unit. They had done, they had, so they had volunteered most of them and they had trained. They were ready to be a combatant unit. Even they, when they first got to France, were put on this kind of duty. And they were asked, their commanding officer was asked, well, you got two options. You can continue to do this, or you can go fight with the French. And as we know, because they are one of the most famous units of the war, they say, we're going to go fight with the French. This is going to be the opportunity that we have. So out of that 93rd Division, which is never a fully constituted division, it's really just four infantry regiments, those four infantry regiments will go and fight with the French because they want to avoid this as trained soldiers 
They want to avoid this as their, as their fate. And so you can just, my point is that we can also see that how many different motivations there are. So on the one hand, you have men of the 369th who say, rather than do this, we will go fight, which might seem a little crazy because you might think, God, who would want to fight in the Western Front? I mean, you can get killed there, right? Wouldn't it be better to stay alive and be in the rear? Someone like Marcus Garvey, I'm not fighting, I'm physically unfit. But, but then these men making a decision, this is what they, what they want to do. That there are many different decisions being made depending on what your motivations were in the, in the war. I'm sorry, did you have another question? Quick question. Yeah. Um, those that decided to stay back and not go forward with the French, was it almost like a penal society? Uh, that's a great question. You mean in terms of how they were being treated yes. in, in the rear? Yes. <coughs> housing and food. Yes. But they were not allowed any real freedom, it sounds like. Yes, well that was certainly the attempt, let's put it that way. That was certainly the attempt, that was exactly right, that you were going to keep black soldiers heavily monitored, you were going to keep them at work, you were going to segregate them from the civilian French population like you would in the United States, right? That you were going to um, make sure that the French population was afraid of these soldiers, right? By spreading stories about them, that that was certainly, that was certainly the, the attempt. But, but what I'm going to say in a second is that that did not actually work out the way military authorities had hoped that it, that it would. The first time. Yeah, the first time, that's right. Luckily so. So I wanted to fl flip back here to another one of these privately produced propaganda posters. As you can see, there's quite a lot of them here. And kind of go back to this idea of what the hope is among many African Americans about the, what the war is going to represent. And so this is a great poster because it's so explicit about the connection back to the Civil War. So here we have the Dawn of Hope and it's a grandfather with his grandson. And he's, he's really saying, this is a new day. I mean, here the sun comes up and finally the Father Abraham's promise is going to be recognized. And you have, once again, Abraham Lincoln, always, always the largest figure when it comes to presidential figures in these posters, holding the Book of Justice in the hand of freedom of 1865. And finally, this is going to be something that, um, uh, that we can see. But if you look at the soldier on the right-hand side here, we see in his plaque a little more doubt that this is going to happen. Because in his plaque, he argues never in the history of the world have black men been treated equally or well. So the grandfather's hopeful, Lincoln's made the promise, but this, this soldier, this officer, he's doubtful. Will this really happen? Can we count on this just happening without us? And I wanted to pick up on his posture here, which is the, the, the gun that's drawn, and it connects really well to your question. Because the gun that's drawn really sort of suggests we have to fight for this. This isn't going to just happen. And we often talk about World War II as the double victory campaign. That's when the slogan is actually coined. But there's no doubt that in the First World War, there's the same idea, that we have two enemies here. We have the enemy of the Germans, and we have the enemy of racism within the military. And so all the things that you were just mentioning about you know, creating this almost penal colony kind of attitude among non-combatant units, both in the United States and overseas, absolutely the intent. Right? It's the worst if you think of the units that stayed in the United States. If you look sometimes at some of the experience of non-combatant units in the United States, it's almost like chain gang. I mean, it's almost the kind of, kind of attitude that's going on here. Um, but you can see that in harking back to this history, there's this incessant theme in the propaganda that we are going to have to take care of ourselves. And here's another one, uh, which is quite interesting here. The Negro people need to help their own. And this is a, a private hospital that's fundraising in the African American community. And back to Crispus Attic, so it's going all the way back to the American Revolution. Right? In terms of remembering, we have, um, we have a long history of shedding blood for this country. German shells draw no color line. 
but the obvious implication is <laughs> Americans certainly do. Right? So this is, I always find that this poster mind-boggling, the idea that you could be wounded fighting for your country and you're not sure that the government will take care of you. Like you're not sure that as a wounded veteran, you will receive the care that you need. That the African American community is going to have to do it for itself. And so this idea that we are going to have to make this happen, I, I want to really underscore that because sometimes when we think about the way that the African American veteran or the African American experience in the war um, uh, tra transforms the civil rights movement, we sort of assume that we have to wait for these soldiers to come back to civilian society before they can actually begin advancing civil rights. But actually what's going on is that these soldiers are doing it while they're in the military. So all these conditions that I'm talking to you about, they are fighting back against these while they're happening. So what can they do? I mean, you're a soldier, what can you actually do? But this is a citizen army. There's a lot of things that a citizen army can do that regular army soldiers can't do. And one thing they can do is they can appeal to advocates in civilian society. So for example, we have enormous number of letters of protest, petitions being signed, uh, affidavits being sent to the NAACP for investigation, asking military authorities to come and rectify abuses that are, that are happening. We have orders being given for black soldiers not to interact with the French population, those orders are universally disregarded. And it's quite gratifying for many soldiers in France when French civilians come to their defense where they are being invited into homes, they're being invited to celebrations, mayors are, are giving them commendations for their good behavior and their contributions to the, to the, to the, to the peace you're seeing that suddenly there are allies that African American soldiers are having, uh, white allies, not American allies, that are, that are important. And going back to this one here, they're fighting, literally fighting, literally fighting. One of the, uh, you know, well, I always like to say, oh, one of the untold stories, of course, there are many untold stories, but, uh, but, but an important untold story about the First World War is the amount of racial violence that occurs within the American military. African American soldiers, combatant or non-combatant, arm themselves and they defend themselves against racial attacks. And you have many examples where white soldiers start thinking twice about attacking black soldiers because they're not so sure they're not gonna come out on the wrong side of that, of that struggle. So you see in this, in this way, efforts for African American soldiers within the military to assert their equality and to try to rectify some of the abuses. But what I want you to think about is that when you're a young man and you go in and you start having these experiences and then you go home, you are changed by that. And when a lot of black veterans come home and they join the Garvey movement or they join the NAACP, why did they decide to do this when they wouldn't have maybe done that before? And these experiences, in a sense, give them a taste of actually fighting for uh, civil rights, and not all, but a lot, continue that in the, in the post-war period. And this is what I like to call um, the political education that soldiers can get by serving. And so I'm kind of, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about the combatant experience, but I'm, I'm emphasizing at this moment the non-combatant experience because we kind of push that aside like that's the experience that doesn't matter. It only matters if you're fighting. But the non-combatant experience is the majority experience for all soldiers in the First World War, white or black, and it's definitely overwhelming the majority experience for African American soldiers. I'm telling you, 89%, that's their experience. So we shouldn't not talk about what 89% of any population go through if we want to understand the war. And so in this sense, this experience is very significant. It's very significant in terms of, in terms of what's going on. Okay. So, 
now I say I will talk about <laughs> the, the, the combatant experience. So here we do have, and I've got a few examples here for our, um, uh, from the 369th. We've got uh, some very well-known individuals that become celebrated uh, in the press in general, not just the African-American press, but, but the mainstream white press as well. And this is, this is the story of Henry Johnson and Needham Roberts. And, and here's some pictures of them on the, on the right there. And this is a very famous poster. This is one of those posters advertised in the crisis that I, from that ad that I, I had on earlier. Not what happened <laughs> in the actual rendition. This looks like Gettysburg to me. This is not fighting on the Western Front. So this is not actually what happened to them. What did happen is that Needham Roberts and Henry Johnson were, were serving with the French as part of the 369th, and they were sent out in May to a listening post. And if, this is a rendition of what the trenches look like. You can see the trenches are sort of a system here. And a listening post, you see it out there, it's all the way out in no man's land. You're, you're on your own. And you're there to listen. That's literally what you're doing. You're listening in case there's an attack. You're listening if there's work parties out there from the other side. Um, you're, you're listening. And your job, if there is an attack or you hear anything funny, is to send up a flare to warn your side in the rear. And of course, if there's an attack, you're, you're gone. I mean, you're in a very exposed position here. It's dangerous even on a nightly basis because what both sides would try to do at night is go grab some prisoners from their enemy's listening posts. It was a great way for you to be able to get some information. So by being exposed out there, a German party, for work party for example, about 25 guys, come out, grab you, pull you back, and then interrogate you to get some information about how many troops you had, what your plans were, where you were from, that kind of thing. And that's exactly what happens to Henry Johnson and Needham Roberts. They're out in this listening post, and a German party comes upon them and tries to take them prisoner. And they become famous for essentially by themselves, and Henry Johnson does most of it, fighting them off. They fight off uh, 25. They, they, they think from the evidence that they have after the tussle that Johnson probably critically wounded or if not killed 10 of the 25. And, it, and, it, and this, this, this battle is recounted because first he uses his gun and then he's out of ammunition and then he uses the butt of his gun and then he uses his hand grenades and then finally he pulls out his knife. And I mean, it's literally a fight to the, to the death. And Johnson survives and so does Roberts, but they're both severely wounded. And in many respects, Johnson will never recover. He's, he's in pain the rest of his life, and it takes a tremendous toll on him. He is, in the African-American community, the most famous hero of the war. And here he's riding down Fifth Avenue when 369th comes home. He's feted. He's, he's asked to come speak. <laughs> he goes across the country when speaking engagements. Um, but he has a tough, tough life. He, he, after about a year, when people begin to lose interest in the war, he starts drinking heavily, he gets divorced, he, he leaves his family, and he dies in 1929, basically penniless. He ends up being buried in Arlington National Cemetery, but in a sense, he's completely forgotten. Now, there are ways in which his story is quite exceptional because of the heroism on the battlefields. But there's other ways that his story is very illustrative. For his heroism, he is one of the first Americans to receive the French Croix de Guerre. So the French immediately, immediately recognize what he's done. How long does it take America to recognize what he's done? Longer than that. <laughs> 2003. <laughs> He gets the Deservice Distinguished Cross. And finally, after a sustained, and I mean sustained campaign by Senator Charles Schumer, he receives the, the Medal of Honor in 2014. And there's a beautiful, beautiful photograph of, of President Obama uh, awarding his family, his, his descendants, 
that medal in a really, really moving ceremony. And it was a lovely moment to have our first African-American president actually rectify this, this injustice. But I was involved in this campaign, and I can tell you, you maybe think it was a slam dunk, but it took years to happen. This was not an easy thing to have, to have, to have, have happen at, at all. And so in that sense, this idea within the African-American community that it's really only the French that appreciate us in, in recognizing that, that this regiment served for 191 days in the front lines, the longest of any American regiment. So they have the record. And we celebrate that, but also we also should, should add to that, what does it mean to serve 191 days in the Western Front? And for a lot of these men, it really was a difficult thing to put behind them. And I think that for Henry Johnson, we see the personal toll that combat can take on an individual. What happened to Roberts? Ro no, no, I wasn't going to talk about Roberts, but Roberts also had a very troubled post-war history, and he ends up committing suicide, so... Needham. N-E-E-D-H-A-M. Needham Roberts. Yeah. What was the main resistance for honoring Johnson? It's because the, I guess, part of it is that the um, Army never, is always reluctant to go back and uh, second guess decisions that were made in the past about Medal of Honor winners. They want it to be such an elevated, an elevated um, award that the concern is that if you start reopening all of these cases, when is that actually going to, going to end? This is, this is what the Army would say. This is what the Army would say. But what was interesting is that he was actually recommended for the award by one of his white commanding officers, Arthur Little, who wrote up in detail exactly what had happened and collected affidavits and had, because you know, there's a lot of evidence that has to be, not that you come back and say, oh, guess what I did. There's a lot of evidence that has to be collected. And he had all of that evidence and, and it was turned down at the time. By the It never even got that far. I mean, it never even got that far through the War Department actually going on to recommend it for the next, for the next step. So it was within the War Department. Yeah, yeah. So, so part of it is, is that reluctance. And what's interesting is that at the same time that they gave Henry Johnson the Medal of Honor, they also gave it to a Jewish American soldier at the same time. And so I think there was a recognition by coupling those two cases to suggest that, that we, we're not going to say to everybody's relatives who were ever turned down for the Medal of Honor, come back to us with more evidence. We're not going to reopen those, but now we're going to see these as rectifying two injustices, racial prejudice and anti-Semitism, which because, again, there had been no Jewish Americans who had received the Medal of Honor in the First World War either. And going back. But it did take a really long time, and I think we might actually say too long. Now, Horace Pippin is another member of the 369th, and if, for those of you who picked up the book uh, from the Library of America, there's actually an excerpt from Horace Pippin's autobiography in that, um, in that little booklet here. And Pippin was another person who had a fairly traumatic battlefield experience. He lasted longer in the front lines than Henry Johnson did. His war came to an end in September of 1918, and he went into battle with the French and as part of the 369th. Uh, he's, he's going across no man's land, jumping from shell hole to shell hole. This is how they're advancing. He's hit in the shoulder and falls into a shell hole. His friend who's with him binds his wound, but then says, I have to keep going, so he leaves him and goes forward. And Pippin decides that he's going to crawl out of the shell hole and try to walk back because he figures, well, I'm just hurt in the shoulder. I can still walk. I'll make it out. But every time he lifts his head up, there's a German sniper that's got a beat on him, and every time he lifts his head up, the sniper fires at him. So he says, all right, I'm trapped. I'm just going to have to stay here for as long as I can. And finally, he's so weak from losing blood and just from the shock that he doesn't even think he can make it, even if he could pull himself out of the shell hole. 
So he just lies down and decides to wait, and about an hour later, a French soldier comes and looks down. So this French soldier comes up to him, sees him lying there, and kind of like gestures to him like he's going to come in and help him. And Pippin is lying there looking at him and is just about to say, you know, watch out for the German sniper, when the German sniper gets the French soldier right through the head and he falls down on Pippin and Pippin is now trapped underneath this dead French soldier. And he writes in his autobiography that, of course, this is a very traumatic experience, but as he lays there for hour after hour, he puts his hands in the man's pockets and the man is carrying water and biscuits, which he eats. And he feels in many ways saved his life. So finally, as the battle pushes on, he is rescued. He's taken to the rear. It doesn't get better from there. He's put on a stretcher and lays in the pouring rain for another 12 hours. And finally, he's, he's taken back to a hospital and his war is over. But he never recovers and he can never forget. And he tries to write about the war, that's what, that's what you have in the packet, but he's not a writer, he's very poorly educated and he doesn't feel that he has words that can describe what he went through. But he had always sketched. And so what he decides to do is he decides to paint. And he starts painting about the war that he experienced. And this is the first painting that he makes of the war called The End of the War Coming Home. And he starts painting others. So we see here being watching a dog fight from shell holes. And here, again, it's not so great to see, but wearing gas attack. These guys are wearing gas masks. And in all of this, he's trying to come to terms with the demons of the war that are still troubling him. He never recovers use of his right arm. And so if we go back to this, paint, this picture here of him, you go here. As you can tell, uh, he's, holding. he's holding his hand with his left, right, in order to direct it. This is how he can actually paint. Now, Horace Pippin at first might seem to have a happy ending to his story because in 1937, he's discovered by the Philadelphia art community and he actually becomes famous. He's able to sell his paintings and, and now live reasonably comfortably um, and it would seem as if he's, he's finally been able to move forward in his life. But he's painting as a sort of self-therapy for these constant trauma that is revisiting him. And that trauma never leaves him. Like Johnson, he drinks very heavily. And in 1946, he'll die uh, prematurely young of a heart attack. And he says the war just, he just could never, ever get it out of out of his dreams. There. Mm -hmm. And so again, we see somebody who suffers for a long time afterwards with the personal costs of what it means to fight in the Western Front. His paintings are very well known now. And in fact, there's just been a retrospective exhibit um, in Philadelphia. I think it's about to go to New York City on art and America, excuse me, World War I and American art and Pippin's paintings are featured very prominently in that exhibit. So a lot of people now are, are becoming well acquainted with, with him as an artist. So, so now, what about the end of the war in terms of politics? Because I've been talking a lot about what it means to, to, to serve, either to work or to fight, and what the costs of fighting are personally for individuals. But what does it mean in terms of politics? Because obviously there's a big political side of the story as well. And, and this, again, you know, one of these posters, what's the hope? Honor and justice to all. That's clearly the hope. Why isn't that going to happen? Let's go back to this poster I started with. Remember how I said, well, when we have evidence, we should think about it, and we should think about who saw it, and, and, and how was it diffused, and who bought it? This is a great example of that, and not just through ads in the crisis. Why do we even have this poster? We have this poster 
because a postmistress in Melbourne, Florida, sent it to the postmaster general to ask him if this was the kind of seditious material that should be banned from the mails under the terms of the Espionage Act. Wow. I'll bet nobody saw that one coming. Yeah. <laughs> right, I talked about it first as just like the kind of normal, everyday pedestrian propaganda you would see, which it is. But this postmistress in Florida sees something else, right? What does she see? She probably sees a family lives better than she does. This is why she's fighting the war. She's not fighting the war so that African Americans, never mind equality, but they can actually have a better life than she's got. Right? In her letter, she says, given the considerable insolence from the Negro element lately, people are getting too big, too big for themselves. Right? This is dangerous. This is seditious in her view. The idea that the racial order would be challenged is seditious for her. Now, we don't have the postmaster general's response, but it was definitely true that there were many African American publications that were banned from the mails for exactly this reason. Because anything that was going to stir up race hatred or give people uh, unreasonable expectations of advancement was considered seditious because it was going to breed disunity, lower morale, and be too disruptive for the war effort. So she certainly had a reason to, to ask that question. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't have it in my notes, actually, but I could give it to you I have because I have the actual letter that, that she sent there. Um, Go find her, yes, that's no, <laughs> there. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear that in their past, right there, right there. Now, we know she wasn't wrong because people, in a sense, had those expectations. But this means that those expectations are going to be contested. And not just in the South, because one of the things that the First World War had generated was the Great Migration. There had been a heavy recruitment in the South of African American workers to come up, places like Chicago, New York, and St. Louis to work in war industries, especially when immigrant labor was cut off because of the war. And it, people, even in Chicago, anticipated this. They anticipated reactions, the same kind of reaction that this woman in Florida has. They anticipated those reactions even in Chicago. The North didn't mean you got away from those kinds of attitudes. These are cards that the Urban League in Chicago would hand out to southern migrants as they arrived at the train station. And they're interesting pieces of advice. On the one hand, it's like, come to us if you need a job or if you need a place to live, right? If you're having trouble, if you need help, you know, you're from the south, you may not understand how things work up here. Maybe you're from a rural area, never lived in a big city before. But, but these other things are different than that, right? Uh, don't loaf. Don't live in crowded rooms. Don't carry on loud conversations in streetcars and public places. Right? Don't keep your children out of school. Uh, don't think, do not think you can hold your job unless you're industrious, sober, efficient, and prompt. Right? This, is, this is like advice about how to live your life, which has got little to do with do you need a job or do you need a place to live. And what's going on here? They're concerned about, these are African-American, middle-class African-Americans handing out these cards to mostly working-class African-Americans who come from the South, and they're concerned about race relations. Right? They're concerned about the reputation of the race and of a backlash from white residents. And they're not wrong to have those concerns, just like the white postmistress in Florida is not wrong to think that African-American soldiers are gonna come back and expect things to change. Right? These expectations on both sides are real. In Chicago, in 1919, we have one of the worst riots, race riots in American history. And what causes that riot? An African-American teenager is swimming in Lake Michigan, and by accident, he goes over this imaginary line that separates the white side of the beach from the black side of the beach. And when he swims over into the white side, he's stoned to death. And that's what starts that race riot. So what these cards are telling Af Southern migrants is that in South, it says white and it says colored. 
Well, that exists here too, but there's no sign to tell you that. That's that imaginary line. You don't know. You have to learn. You notice know, so there's a constant pattern of, of laziness, oppression, and then also now with, with this, you get the introduction of class too because you have Absolutely. to do African Americans assuming that the African Americans in the South do not know how to act. So yep. stay in your place and keep your mouth shut and we'll be just fine. Yep, that's right. And, and basically, these are, the, these are middle class rules and we want you to behave in this way. One of the really interesting things that creates tension within the African American community is, for example, church. What does it mean to go to church? There are a lot of Southern migrants open up sort of these storefront Baptist churches, a lot of singing, very loud call, you know, call and response, not come into church in your Sunday best, sit there, hands folded, you know, sing hymns. And even that creates a lot of tensions of this, you know, you're too loud and boisterous, you're giving us a bad reputation, we're all gonna suffer for that, right? So you have this element of kind of social control even within the population, but that's a fantastic point, that there's a lot of class tensions that are going on as well. And, you, and regional tensions, right? And we could see that in the reverse during the war, in terms of the 369th, you know, they're sent down to South Carolina, Spartanburg, South Carolina. They last 10 days down there. <laughs> and they're really worried that there's just going to be an all-out, you know, race battle. And they, they pull the 369th out because the, you know, people in South Carolina is like, these northern Negroes come down here. They have all these ideas. And these guys come, a lot of them are from Harlem. They're like, we're not going to put up with this. And so it's, it's a very combustible situation. They come, they come out. So, so you definitely see all of those tensions kind of, kind of coming together here. And like I said, the idea that there is going to be violence is not a misplaced fear. 1919 is one of the worst years of racial violence in American history. And then we're speaking about the Harlem Renaissance with Langston Hughes. Well, Claude McKay also has a sort of very famous poem that responds to this. And sort of, you, know, you can read it to yourself here, but I think the most important one is pressed to the wall, dying, but fighting back. And I think that's the theme that I'm trying to really emphasize today, that this idea of fighting back becomes an ethos that's really inculcated into the African-American soldier in many, many ways throughout the war. And fighting back doesn't just mean you have to be fighting in the front lines. This is where I think that the non-combatant and combatant experience really come together in this respect, this idea of fighting back. In Chicago, there are a lot of African-American veterans that are in the city at that point, and they participate, and there are whites killed in that riot as well, that there's, there's fighting back that's, go that's going on. And these are men who, as I mentioned, are joining uh, the uh, Marcus Garvey's movement, you know, Marcus Garvey is fighting back. He's emphasizing economic self-sufficiency, racial pride. He's emphasizing a black world, a sort of pan-African vision. And you know, when Marcus Garvey is talking about this in 1914, 1915, it's kind of just an idea. But now he can talk to black veterans, African-American veterans, who've been in France, and they've actually met people from Africa. Now, they have had, they've met, this is, a, this is a postcard that is uh, sold to African-American soldiers to send home. So just like I'm telling you there's privately produced posters for people to hang in their houses, there's also um, YMCA uh, secretaries, uh, African-American YMCA secretaries, who, who commission French artists to create posters for, for the men that they're serving. And there's a whole collection of these posters, I mean these postcards, and he, this is a great one. And this is saying, you know, this, we're mutually respecting each other. This is a French, uh, a West African soldier, probably from Senegal. And, and so this Pan-African ideal now has a concreteness to it because you have men who come back to your community and say, I have met men from the French colonies. I have met men from the British West Indies. I have met men from North Africa, and in fact, we can unify because our problems actually are quite similar. So you see the beginning of Pan-Africanism as a political movement. Um, we have the NAACP. Uh, many important veterans uh, become leaders, many veterans become important leaders in the NAACP. I just picked one here, Charles Hamilton Houston, who was an officer 
in the First World War, and he becomes the major legal strategist who figures out the strategy for Brown versus Board of Education. He's, he's, he's not alive when the decision finally happens, but that incremental strategy of how to begin to pick away at segregated education, he's the one who devises that. And he, he, he says, retro, retrospectively, in the Second World War, you know, the hate and scorn showered on us Negro officers by our fellow Americans convinced me that there was no sense in my dying for a world ruled by them. I made up my mind if I got through this war, I would study law and use my time fighting for men who could not strike back. So again, you see that idea of fighting, of fighting back. And here's somebody who really links his political awakening to his experiences in France overseas. And he's, he's remembering, as I said, the difference between how Americans treated him and how French treated him. And there's just a few, you know, random examples, you know, French children, and here's some soldiers helping a French family rebuild uh, their house. This, these are men of the 369th, all wearing Croix de Guerre. These are the memories you come back with. You look to France. You look to France as being the example of democracy in the, in the, in the world here. Yeah. So, Wow, I talked for a long time. <laughs> I'll just wrap up with one really quick, quick uh, thing, and that is in terms of politics to also remember that, veteran, these, that African Americans come home and are not just African Americans, they're African American veterans. And that veteran designation is an important one, and it becomes another way to fight back. The government does say Veterans are eligible for certain things. They are eligible for disability. They are eligible for hospitalization. They are eligible for adjusted compensation. This is a, a certificate that World War I veterans get in 1924. The NAACP in the interwar period as part of its campaign for equality fights on behalf of veterans to demand that the government actually give black veterans equal treatment. And in that sense, the fight for veterans' benefits becomes part of the civil rights campaign. It's not a thing apart. Every time a black veteran can get admitted into the hospital and get the treatment the government has promised him, the NAACP chalks that up as a victory for our side, a victory for civil rights. In other words, they're working together. It's not as if, OK, now you fought. And so we don't think about the veteran anymore. Because part of the legal strategy of the NAACP is to continually force the federal government to recognize equal rights, to recognize the 14th Amendment. And veterans become a very important vehicle for doing that. And so these veterans are thinking about their own welfare, but they're also part of this larger movement. And so in that sense, we want to say that it's not just the veterans join the NAACP, but they give the NAACP additional ways to fight for equal rights that begin to sort of incrementally chip away at this. Because by this point, a lot of the strategy is to get the federal government to recognize the 14th Amendment and that that will become a way eventually, which is the case when you think of Brown for Support Education, that's eventually what brings about a lot of the dismantling of Jim Crow. And so in that sense, veterans, don't just episodically connect to the movement. They really do both personally and symbolically and legally for the rest of the 20th century. So I'm going to just fast forward here to this, I had a little more to say, to these posters from World War II. You would never in a million years have seen a poster like this in World War I. Never. Ever. <laughs> You're not going to see United We Win and white and black working side by side. And I think you begin to get over this decade, over these two decades, a sense that the military doesn't have to reflect the racial divisions and prejudices of American society. That's the idea in World War I. You have to reflect it. By World War II, you begin to have the idea that the military can correct it. And I think that if we look at a painting that Pippin, back to Pippin, of my last one, painted in 1943, you can see he's got that idea in his head, and this comes from World War I. He's got black soldiers from World War II, 
well, sort of. They're kind of a mix because that's a World War I uniform. But they're meant to be from World War II. And white soldiers, and they're reaching across. They're ready to shake each other's hands. But it's Mr. Prejudice from outside, from the civilian world, who's, who's there to, to cut them apart again, of course, with the Klan up there in, in the side. And I think that this is part of the transforming way that we, we've come to look at military service. And so I'm going to end by going back to some of the remarks that Michael ended with, which is this idea that through military service, we can, in fact, put racial divisions aside, and this can become a vehicle for actual advancement in our society. I think that's an idea that we embrace now. That the military is one of the institutions in American society that has um, been successful at really rewarding merit as opposed to uh, uh, holding on to a lot of the prejudices in our civilian society that still, that still exist. My concluding remark is that doesn't, didn't just happen. Wars didn't make that happen. The kind of activism that I'm talking about on the part of individuals, that's what made it happen. That's what will make it continue to happen. Their ethos was fight back. I'm going to argue in conclusion that it should be ours as well. Thank you very much. Do you have a question? Do you have a microphone, James, or are we just going to? No? OK. I'll try to just repeat it then, so okay. people, if I can hear you. Yeah. Or speak up. That's better. <laughs> Yep. Because during that time, yeah. you couldn't get treated by any, you could die if yeah. you went to a white hospital. That's a great question. So it, on the front lines, and in Red Cross hospitals, because Red Cross was, was operating a lot of the hospitals behind, there was no segregation. It was segregation by disease and by injury. So if you have influenza, you're in the influenza ward. If you uh, need an amputation, you're with the other amputees. Now, that might seem contradictory, because I was making such a huge point about how the military is so insistent on following the norms of civilian society. And here's where you realize that they're fighting with themselves, because on the one hand, they want efficiency, but then on the other hand, they don't want problems from civilians. And they don't want problems from soldiers. So in the, in, when white soldiers complain about this, they say, well, just ignore them. They can't do anything. They're injured. They can't fight. So since they can't cause any disturbances, we're not going to worry about what they think. We're just going to leave it the way it is. So it's only when they believe that there could really be um, discipline problems that they're going to really insist on segregation. And I should just point out that this is what created so much instability. Because you had some camps in the north where you had commanders of the camp who said, forget it. Everything's integrated. All the YMCA huts, all the recreational facilities, all the bathrooms, everything. Right? And then southern soldiers came in and said, what are you talking about? It's like, you can't do anything about it. I'm in charge. I'm going to do it. And this, these examples, I'm sorry, I'm going to give you a long answer, but these examples were important for the civil rights movement because what they would say is that this shows you that in the military, if a commander gives an, off, an order, it must be obeyed. So if you order that everything has to be desegregated, it will, because you have the authority to make that happen. And so they argue that those examples of when it does happen means that's what the military should be doing overall. And the military doesn't do it in the First World War. They resist. But think about how the military actually desegregates finally. In 1948, Truman issues an executive order and says, it's going to happen. I don't care. And you're going to make it happen. It's the military. You have to do what we say. So in the end, that's exactly how it does happen. But you get those examples that become important in the movement kind of pushing forward with their claim. Yeah. What just got you interested in military history? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. So um, I was very interested in as a student in progressivism, which is the period of time when this is occurring. 
And I got, uh, for a, a project, for master's thesis, I wrote about this group called the Commission on Training Camp Activities, which were progressive reformers uh, that went into the training camps and they were trying to teach the soldiers to live better, more cleanly. Almost like those urban league people, right? Come in and say, you know, stop drinking, stop gambling, stop looking for women, stop chasing women. Um, and so, but after about a year of reading about these progressives, they were so uptight and boring, I thought, what had these soldiers seem so interesting? Because <laughs> they're misbehaving in so many interesting ways. Anyway, that's what kind of got me started on soldiers. And, um, and then once I got into it, uh, of course, I was actually trained as a social historian, not a military historian in the beginning. And so that got me interested in kind of all this turmoil that was going on and what was, what was behind it. And then here I am, 20 years later, <laughs> still in World War I. <laughs> okay. Could you say a little bit more about why they restrained the enlistments, voluntary enlistments, in favor of the conscription. What was the reason? So that was a progressive idea. So the idea here was that if you just let people volunteer, you have no control over who comes into the military. So if you look at Britain, who did that, and then their best and brightest rushed to the colors, uh, volunteered, and then were wiped out, this can be a disaster in terms of fighting a long war, where you not only need sustained leadership, but you also need to ensure that your civilian production and munitions, you know, continues apace. So the, 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 the irony was that they were not using conscription because they thought um, people didn't want to fight. They were using conscription because they thought the wrong people would want to fight. And they, um, they called it, in fact, this is the rebranding of conscription. This is the moment when you don't call it conscription anymore, you call it selective service. And this is, this is an, a brand new idea. You're selected to serve in the military. But you're, everybody's serving. So even if you get a deferment, you need to be serving the civilian sector in some way also in, you know, for, the, for the war. So that was, so it's progressive modern management techniques. It is. But, you know, look at, um, in the Cold War, when we look at the draft, they did the same thing. It was all that channeling, right? You could get a, a that, in the First World War, being in college didn't give you a deferment. But in the Cold War, being in college gave you a deferment because you wanted to encourage, we believed we were in a kind of, you know, math, science deficit. That at that point, it was with the Soviet Union. You want to channel more people into these careers. If you give them deferments in the military, you'll encourage people to do that. So it's kind of this way to manage your, your manpower in service of national defense. That's their, that's their idea. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Do you want to address the 92nd and the impact of how uh, that regiment so the 92nd had, of course, a completely different experience. And, and so the, the 92nd, where we, um, we think they remain under American command, and they, they have a very difficult time. They are a full division, so they're supposed to be operate, able to operate with all the component parts. Um, when they train in the United States, this notion that you can't put a lot of black soldiers together in one place means that component parts of the 92nd Division are spread out through the whole United States. That doesn't happen to any white division. A division is in one training camp together. They can train together. And the reason this matters is that when you go into battle on the Western Front, you go in not just the infantry, but you go in with combined arms. So the infantry has to have artillery support, has to have air support, the, your signal corps has to know what they're doing. You have to have all of this coordination. If you're separated out over the whole country, you don't have an ability to train together. So the 92nd Division comes to France already with problems. I mean, they do have problems because of this, this, this manpower decision. These manpower decisions have hampered their training. Then uh, the 368th goes into battle, uh, performs very poorly, is pulled out, and and the conclusion is, well, well, you see, we told you that they can't fight. Right? And so what you see going on in the 92nd Division, which has many black officers, is a kind of wholesale um, set of reviews where a lot of black officers are considered unfit for, uh, for 
leadership, and so they're, they're taken away from the units, and in a kind of demotion of the 92nd to the rear area. Now, interestingly, the 92nd has a bit of a revival at the very end of the war. So the last 10 days of the war, you know, there is fighting that goes on to the very, very end. And the last 10 days of the war, while they're in France and they're able to actually train, as they should have been training in the US, the 92nd goes back into battle and actually ends the war on a high note. They actually end performing very, very well and they're, they're, they're sent in to rescue some white regiments, which is quite interesting that they're going in to, to rescue these, these regiments that are, that are encircled. Uh, but that story just gets forgotten because the story is they don't know how to fight and then you have the armistice, it sort of overshadows it. So it's, it's interesting that um, in, the, in War Department circles, the story that's told again and again in the 1920s and 1930s is the story of the 368th and their failures, not the story of the 369th and its successes and, hey, wait, French command, American command, shouldn't we maybe to do something from that there? So that was a very different experience and the bitterness of that for a lot of veterans of the 92nd, only reinforced the idea that it was only with the French could African Americans expect a fair deal. And many African American soldiers who would say, it was only in France that I finally felt for the first time like an American, that I was an American first. That's what I was. Um, and that was a memory that the experience of the 92nd reinforced from a different from a different angle. Thanks for that question. That was a good question. Yeah. How were other minorities treated? So uh, there were no segregated units for ethnicity or even for Native Americans. There were certainly plenty of prejudices against different ethnic groups and there were certainly plenty of eth inner ethnic violence within uh, within units. But for the most part, the military worked very hard to see military service as an opportunity to assimilate immigrants. And so what you had, I told you one out of every five soldiers was foreign born. Many soldiers came in, didn't speak English, didn't read and write English. So you had schools that were created for those soldiers, the idea that you were going to teach them to be good Americans, that this again was the progressive impulse that you were gonna respect their customs. You were, we had in some training camps, uh, kosher meals being prepared, different religious services, uh, the idea of recognizing holidays. Because many of these immigrants that came in were our allies. They came from nations we were allied with, so they didn't, and they needed the manpower. So there was actually in some respects, if you look at the wartime, military, it's a bit of a mixed bag. I'm talking about this very heavy-handed, sort of repressive uh, racial policy making. But when it came to immigrant groups, it was actually quite benevolent. And if you look at progressivism, it was much more on the sort of Jane Adams settlement house. We're going to recognize that immigrants are a value to us and that they, they are intelligent and they come with many benefits as opposed to a kind of harsh repressive 100% Americanism approach. So it's very different. It did, it did. Asians were not segregated. But again, I don't want to pretend that there was not prejudice against immigrant groups because there definitely was. So, but in overall policy, there was an attempt to try to meld these units into you had some very interesting things. There, I don't know if you guys have ever seen these postcards, but there are sets of postcards where they, they love to, to make soldiers stand in shapes. So I don't have them with me, but there's this great postcard where it's 40,000 soldiers, and they're all standing on these little pieces of cloth. And from a platform, somebody takes a picture of it, and they're standing in the shape of the Statue of Liberty. And it's crazy. But when they write about it, they say, see, they're learning what these icons mean. We're teaching them to be good Americans by making them stand in the hot sun for three hours while you take a picture. <laughs> but that's, but that's, that's, the, that's what's going on in their minds. That raises the question of why, if you've served in the 
in the United States Army, why don't you become an automatic citizen at the end of your service? Well, you do, and that is introduced in the First World War. So in the First World War, there is legislation that's passed that says that if you become, if you serve, you, you, you never have to, you never automatically become, because they don't want to make you become a citizen against your will. But if you apply to become a citizen, all the normal requirements are waived for you. And that matters because in 1917, we introduced a literacy requirement. So uh, after 1917, if you're not literate in your native language, you, you theoretically can't become a citizen. And that waives residency requirements and all of those things for people who are, who are um, serving in the military. So that, that, becomes, that becomes law during the war, exactly what you're saying. It's, I mean, it's still an important part of our, our military policy in terms of manpower. I mean, immigrants have always been a very important part of our country, and, and you know, wartime's a perfect example to see that. And in terms of Asians, there just weren't very many. There were some, but, not, but they weren't segregated, and neither were uh, Native Americans. Good. That was a lot of questions, which is great. Good. All right, well, thank you very much for your attention.